that is something I actually identified myself early on in my career is it didn't matter what position you started at. Um, if you were smart, you had good work ethic, um, and you understood the role and you could do it, you could grow quickly. Welcome to the Attraction Pros Podcast, where we discuss the latest trends and challenges facing the attractions industry today. We chat with some of the top leaders in the field and provide resources that will help develop your career in this great industry. I am Josh Liebman. I am obsessed with the guest experience and helping attractions make that their top priority for success. And I'm Matt Heller. I am passionate about organizational effectiveness, leadership development, and employee engagement. Now sit upright, hold on tight, and get ready for the Attraction Pros Podcast. Hey, Matt, how's it going? It's going fantastically, Josh. How are you? Woohoo! We had like a almost a snare drum in there, a little, a little, a little made a little rhythmic. Why not? Brush your drummer side out just to just to smidge. <laughs> yeah. A smidge, a smidge. Yeah. Question for you. Yeah. If I were to say, Matt, meet me tomorrow at one p.m. in front of Windsor Castle, and gave no extra additional context and said, I will be unavailable to reach by phone, email, text, or Slack. Do you think you could meet the meet me at 1 p.m. in front of Windsor Castle? Well, I know I could. Whether or not I could get there by tomorrow by 1 o'clock, based on where I am in my travel, that's that's a different story. But yes, I, I, I feel confident that I could I could meet you at Windsor Castle or almost any castle landmark i'll say well castle sure um but if you were to say you know meet me in south dakota in front of um uh mount rushmore i could probably do that too all right why do you ask i ask that because our (laughs) guest today is deborah eicher who we get to hear her whole career story uh and amazing lessons we get to hear all about res rides but I also had the opportunity to work for Deborah many years ago. And on my first trip to the UK, when I was in my early 20s, and this was, uh, let's see, I, I know I had I had an iPhone. So we definitely had like navigation on our phones, but there was no Uber. And living in the US, particularly, I was living in Florida at the time, I was not used to taking trains anywhere. I wasn't used to taking trains or taxis at all. If I wasn't driving, I wasn't getting there. And Deborah said to me, Josh, when you get to London, you need to meet me in front of Windsor Castle at 1 p.m. And then we're going to go to Legoland Windsor, where we're then going to meet our client XYZ. But be there at 1 p.m. Apparently, I did. And (laughs) I can't tell you how I got there or how I figured it out. But using, I guess, just the, the scrappiness of finding my way around a country that I had never been to before, uh, somehow made it work. That is impressive. If I were to think back to now, if you would have said, could you have done all that when you were 23? That is a different question because I feel like now I've, I've had enough experience in my life to travel that I could probably figure it out. And especially with all the tools that we have now. Um, but I've also done that where I, I think back to things I've done in the past. I'm like, how did I even do that? Like, how did I get there? How did, it... but it also fascinates me. And this is probably a different story for a different time. Um, but it fascinates me how you think about all the things that have to happen for even two people to get into one place. You know, like yeah. if you and I were to meet up in Orlando, you know, all the things that have to happen, all the choices that you and I make, all the the steps that we take, all the things that we have no control over, whether it's an Uber or it's a plane or it's a, you know, whatever is going to get in our way. But it all comes together. And then you think about all these times when people, you know, 30,000, 40,000 people descend on Orlando for IAPA in November and all the things it took for things, you know, everything had to be aligned just right for all of that to happen. I don't know. To me, that's just it's fascinating. We're we're getting pretty deep here. I know. I know. That's why I said this. Another story for another time. Things, Things to ponder. Yes. Yes. So Deborah Eicher is the International Sales and Marketing Director for RES Rides, which is a ride manufacturer that 
built some pretty unique rides. I would say they are not your typical cookie cutter attractions manufacturer. They've got some pretty unique designs. In fact, you were telling me that you stopped and, and just watched one not too long ago and, and just, just watched it operate for about 15 total minutes, didn't you? Absolutely. When you're going from coaster to coaster, 15 minutes is a lot. You That's know, true. it sounds you, like it's not that long, but 15 minutes on a, on but, a coaster. You know, and so this was this was the uh, uh, you know coaster nerd con twenty four. We were at Silver Dollar City. I think we were heading toward Outlaw Run, and we walked by um, you know this one path where you could look through the trees and you could see the lift mechanism for their new raft ride that Res Rides built. And it was so fascinating for for a rides guy to look at how this worked because you're used to seeing a raft go maybe up an elevator or maybe up a, a lift type of thing. This was a rotating elevator that had four platforms i'm not going to do it justice by the way that i i describe it but four platforms that the 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 boat would come up onto right and then the whole thing would rotate and that that piece would lift up and then another boat would come in and it was timed perfectly and it was it was fascinating to watch i mean it was like one of those um uh I forget what you call them, but there are those motion things that you see, those perpetual motion machines that you mm -hmm. see that you it just they're just mesmerizing to watch. That's that's how we felt. And like it was it was worth it for us to just stand there and watch. Like for us, that was the attraction. And it was yeah. really, really cool. Yeah. Uh, so RES also just won a brass ring. They've won many brass rings and many other awards as well. But most recently in 2023, uh, got the brass ring for best new product for family ride or attraction. And uh, I, I don't want to give too much away. I'll let Deborah it, explain in detail that ride, that attraction, uh, but sounds just so deserving of, of that award and, and just so fascinating. And uh, we also get to hear Deborah talking about mentoring young talent as well. Speaking of... You are one of those young talents that she got to to mentor, and I got to do something unique today on the on the podcast. When we have a guest, and that's to ask you a question. I know I ask you a lot of questions when it's just you and I, uh, but what I wanted to know was what you learned from Deborah. And I guess we we won't share it now, but you know during the interview you had some some really great insight there. Um, and she also talks about one of the lessons she learned early on was future proofing the job or future proofing your business. And we get to hear about that from many different angles in terms of her uh, experience throughout the industry. Yeah, absolutely. She spent a, a lot of time um, on the board of directors for the IAPA Foundation as well. And so she gets to talk about how uh, in that role, she was able to, to serve and uh, be able to mentor a, a lot of young talent and be able to, to uh, foster career development and growth, which uh, like you mentioned, for me, I'm very personal, personally grateful for Deborah's initiative to to do that as well. When uh, when she hired me many years ago, like I said, I was I was in my early 20s and coming into a, a managerial role and really uh, thrust into that position. And and uh, she really helped me grow and develop and uh, and really become become a, a leader in ways that I never uh, that I never been before. That's awesome. And she helped you find Windsor Castle. Yes. That's true. And we get to hear a funny story about a train platform as well. But we'll let Deborah share that. So should we get to this interview with Deborah Iger? Let's do it. Hey, Deborah, welcome to the Attraction Pros podcast. We are so excited to have you on today. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great, Josh. And, you know, I really appreciate you having me as a guest on your podcast. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, we are too. So excited to chat with you. So to uh, to kick this off here, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us about your background and your career. Sure. Uh, well, I grew up in Iowa. I graduated from the University of Iowa in Iowa City with a Bachelor of Business degree. And yeah, I had to get my first job. So um, my ambition was to work in banking um, or finance. So in the meantime, I took a job at a fashion retailer at the local mall. And that was meant to be a temporary gig, you know, while my big job was coming up in the big city. And for a girl from Iowa City, big city meant Minneapolis or Chicago. So after working in the fashion retailing role for a month, to my surprise, I was a top seller in the nation. Uh, so they sent corporate down to the store to check out who this girl was, what was she doing? They interviewed me. Uh, they watched me to evaluate my technique and asked me to be in their fast track management training program. So I thought, hmm, that sounds interesting. 
So two months later, they sent me to St. Louis, Missouri uh, to manage a brand new store. And that store opening was a little bit delayed. So I worked at the flagship store there in St. Louis and then a further delay. So they sent me to Knoxville, Tennessee. And I was very young. They sent me in to fix the store. Um, I had to hire a new manager, uh, turn around the entire operation. Uh, and I was way out in Tennessee all by myself, no support from the company. Uh, after two months, I accomplished that mission. I went back to St. Louis and managed the store opening there for about a year. And I hired a staff and a manager that uh, were really stellar. And uh, we blew away all of the goals. Um, we had tight inventory control. Um, we won fashion merchandising awards. And I may have even run a fashion show or two. So yeah, that's kind of a different way to get into our industry. Um, so after that, uh, with my master's degree in hand, uh, which I went to night school to get, um, I thought, you know, it's time for that banking or finance role. So I started working for a financial institution and uh, we offered mortgages and other finance, um, consumer finance. And within six months, I was a branch manager there. Um, did that for a couple of years, went to night school, got certified in uh, tax accounting for uh, preparation of single partnership all the way up to corporate taxes. So I used to do about 40 tax returns a year. And then I took a role as a controller, which is like a CFO for a holding company in Boulder, Colorado. Um, did that for three or four years. And I thought, you know, this isn't really my gig. It's all a bit samey, doing the same tax filings on the same date every month. Um, so I moved to Orlando to be closer to family. And that is how I got into this industry. I took a role as operations manager for Flight Avionics of North America, uh, which is now PulseWorks. And Flight Avionics, we manufactured and operated flight simulators on decommissioned aircraft carrier museums, um, like the Intrepid or the USS Midway, um, even at the um, USS Missouri out in Pearl Harbor. And that was really a great experience for me um, when I started the role, I was, again, operations manager. With six months, I was vice president. And then uh, a year later, I was president and chief operations officer. And I grew that company from one location into 20 locations. I took it from a hobby uh, into a very profit-making company for the owners. I really enjoyed that role. Um, I got to go to some great places and these aircraft carriers have, you know, great history. Um, I got to meet presidents, five-star generals. I rode our simulator um, with a Pearl Harbor survivor who was in his nineties. Um, when I was at the USS Ms., uh, Midway out in San Diego, a gentleman came up to me after riding our simulator and wanted to tell me a story that, when he was a young boy and they were fleeing um, Ho Chi Minh City, um, he, him and his family packed up in their two passenger plane. His parents put them in the belly of the plane in a compartment and fled. They flew over the USS Midway and the father dropped a belt with a message onto the aircraft carrier deck saying, please, can we land? Um, we are fleeing and we have no petrol. I still get goosebumps when I tell this story. And this was his pilgrimage and his first time that he had been back to the USS Midway. So it was a really special time. Um, it was great to work on these aircraft carriers. Um, we also then um, put our simulators in zoos for safari expeditions um, and also at aquariums for submarine expeditions. And what this role was really unique in that it wasn't, it was also B2B and B2C. So for example, um, I had to really hone in on my business development skills because to take a company from one site to 20, you have to go out and find those sites. So I had to convince these very prestigious aircraft carriers that you know we could put a flight simulator there, we could operate it, and then they could receive revenues um, from the operation. So we did joint revenue shares. So not only was that a business development role, um, there was also the relationship um, with the different aircraft carriers, museums, and zoos. Um, so 
I had to meet with them monthly, tell them how things were going, show them how we were increasing revenues for them year and year. And those revenues were very important for them to, um, you know, protect um, all these aircraft, uh, vintage aircraft that was on the carriers. It also gave kids a great chance to see what it was like um, to be a fighter pilot and take off on a sortie from the carrier. And then, of course, there was a huge operational side. I had to hire staff, um, hire manager. I had to hire technicians, which was um, easy to find with the aircraft carriers because there was always some guys hanging around that were former, for example, um, aircraft mechanics. Um, so it was quite um, a different type of operation to run. Um, back then at the aircraft carriers, they didn't always have internet. So we had to use <clears throat> facsimiles, if you remember those, to share our results back and forth from Orlando to wherever. So after working there for 10 years, I was approached by an international recruiter and they said there was a company that was interested in speaking to me about a role. And really, uh, I had no interest in leaving my current role. I was so very happy. Um, it, it was really, you know, working well for both myself and the owners. Uh, but I was curious. So I went and talked to this gentleman that had flown over from London and had a nice conversation over my lunch break, went back to my office. And I got a call from the recruiter saying that they wanted to have a further conversation with me. And in fact, would I fly to London to meet with uh, the owners of the company, which was Fidelity. Um, so I thought, well, I could take some vacation, fly over to London, check it out, why not? So I flew um, over uh, to meet with this company. And what I remember from that time in London is there were actually um, riots going on against bankers. And they called me up and said, you're coming to meet us in the Banking Financial District of London. And just so you know, we're not wearing suits. You can if you want. So yeah, I was a little nervous. And when I arrived to London, I went over, tried to get to the Bank of England. There were helicopters, crowds. It was absolutely crazy. I went up to literally a line of riot dress uh, police officers and said, uh, tomorrow I have to get over there for an interview. Do you think that's going to happen? And they're like, no. So anyway, what can you do? The next morning, lo and behold, everything had cleared out. So that was just a little side story. <laughs> I went to the interview and I had to give like a 30 page PowerPoint presentation to Fidelity, which, as you know, is the largest mutual fund house in America. And after that, I left and got another call from the recruiter saying that they wanted me to meet with their CFO later that evening. And I thought, oh, I really planned on going touristing around London. So I stayed in my pinstripe suit, walking down Fleet Street and headed over to ride uh, the London Eye and to visit Madame Two Swords. And later that evening met with their CFO. A little fun story is, but never offer to meet someone on the footsteps of St. Paul's Cathedral. That is a very common meeting place. So I'm meeting this bloke that I had never met before and went up to this random gentleman. Are you Mark? No. Are you Mark? No. Are you Mark? No, but I would like to be. And I thought that's it. I'm not asking anyone else if they're Mark. Anyway, Mark did find me and we had a little dinner and a chat. Uh, flew back uh, to Orlando the next day. No sooner had I landed there it was a message from the recruiter saying they wanted to hire me. And I started to get nervous because I thought, ooh, this is getting out of control. I really like my role at Flight Avionics. And so the recruiter was very, um, uh, very good at pitching for this company and really pressed on me that I had been at flight for 10 years and I'd grown it from one to 10 sites or 20 sites, excuse me, and that I'd really done all that I can do for the company. There weren't, there was no desire to um, have more locations. It was to maintain. And I thought, hmm, I have hired a great crew. I've, I've left things very future proofed at flight. Uh, and she also said that this was a good opportunity to go international. 
and worked for a bigger company that operated in more geographies. So I thought, okay, on a wing and a prayer, I accepted. And so uh, the company was Pixolve. Um, Pixolve operated um, uh, photo concessions at um, theme parks, attractions, zoos, aquariums, anywhere you spend a day out, the London Eye, Madame Tussauds. Um, so that was, you know, really great experience for me. I was hired to run the U.S. division. Um, so I was president and chief operations officer there. Um, after a couple of years, um, and then also my engagement on the global management team and many trips uh, across the pond, um, I uh, was sought out by Merlin's Entertainment for my results that I was achieving at, at their uh, midways. So I became the international relationship manager uh, for Pixel for key clients. And then I really got into a niche position where I worked with the Asia uh, Midways uh, for Madame Tussauds, um, and then also began to do business development in Middle East, Europe, and Asia. So lo and behold, that recruiter was right. Um, had I not taken that step, I don't think I would have launched international. And so here I am now living in London, um, working for a Swiss company as an American. So I, I actually really thank that recruiter. Um, so yeah, when I was at Pixel, I had a little opportunity to work with Josh. Maybe we'll cover that later on in the uh, our discussions here today. But it, those were truly special times. And um, we worked uh, at Pixel when it was a time that um, print was really going into digital. Um, and the consumption of, of media was really changing. So that was a great time. So after my stint with Pixolv, I moved to the UK to get married, uh, yes to a Brit. And uh, I had, had no sooner packed up all my things. They were somewhere on a cargo ship uh, sailing across the Atlantic. Uh, when I got a call from another supplier asking me if I would help them with RFP in the Middle East that they had struggled to gain ground. So no sooner I landed in London, I flew to Dubai and spent two weeks there. And so really during that time, which was from about 2014, I had sort of a niche uh, situation being an American living in London is I had a myriad of suppliers coming to me that were either in the US that wanted to launch in UK, Europe, or even Middle East Asia, or I had European companies that were looking to launch uh, in the US. I even had some companies approach me that were wanting to launch their product into the industry for the very first time. Um, so I really felt that that was a superior experience that really taught me about the myriad of companies that operate as manufacturers and suppliers, what their challenges are, um, how they want to uh, strategize their growth in different territories around the world. Um, <clears throat> so that led us up to about COVID pandemic, which we all want to forget. And that was really unique here in London because we had a hard shutdown. And for a greater part of a year, we weren't allowed to leave the home except for one hour a day by ourselves to take exercise. And we had to stay in a very short radius. I think it was maybe three or four miles from our home. So I started running up and down our street, literally back and forth. There were no cars. And I thought, this is not going to go well for me. I cannot stay in the house. So I volunteered as a vaccinator. And in the early dark days of early COVID, I left the house, took trains when no one was on the train, and went and trained to vaccinate. And my experience goes back to Iowa because they said, why would you be qualified to be a vaccinator? And I explained that, look, I grew up on a farm. I used to vaccinate sheep. <laughs> so I, anyway, that's what got me into the vaccination, I guess. Um, yeah, so I vaccinated 6,000 people over six months. Then when things started to gradually open back up, um, I had worked with RES Rides for you know two or three years at this time. And um, I was asked to be their international sales and marketing director. And so, yeah, that's what I'm doing today. Wow. That's, that's a little bit about my background. 
Yeah, what a fascinating story. So many twists and turns like our industry. Um, one sort of trend or pattern uh, I noticed in some of your accounts was how quickly you moved up in some of those industries. And you said, I was there for two months and I was you know, promoted or I was there for six months and, and moved up. So I'm curious, what were some of the qualities that you brought? You know, I'm sure you had drive and, you know, um, you know, a great attitude and things like that. But I'm just curious, what were some of those things that those organizations saw in you that allowed you to move up so quickly? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And that is something I actually identified myself early on in my career is it didn't matter what position you started at. Um, if you were smart, you had good work ethic um, and you understood the role and you could do it, you could grow quickly. And, you know, early in my career, I read this book called The First 90 Days, and it really talked about understanding, you know, what you need to do early on. Um, what KPIs um, are important to the organization, and then looking for an early win to really shine a light on uh, your results-driven uh, focus. Uh, so that really paid off, just really understanding. And, you know, I literally would, you know, almost write it on the top of my hand, I have to do this by this date to show I can do this job. And I just would focus on that laser-like. And, and obviously being very collaborative uh, and engaging and communicating. And also a little Iowa humble pie always went a long ways. <laughs> Excellent. So Deborah, I'd love to talk about what you're doing today and talk about RES Rides. So for those who might not be familiar, can you tell us about what, what is RES Rides and, uh, and, and what do you do? Yeah, so as I said, I'm the International Sales and Marketing Director for RES Rides. Um, RES Rides um, was created in 2015 by Roman Roth and Willie Walzer. Um, and between them, they have over 60 years experience um, creating, um, installing uh, amusement and water rides all over the world. Uh, so Roman and Willie, after working together for many years, they really felt that they were installing the same kind of rides all over the world. And um, they really wanted to create a company that uh, they could put their creative engineering to work and design rides that were truly different to other uh, manufacturers. And so the driving force um, at RES Rides is to create rides that are completely unique, that are safe, and that are of the highest quality. And of course, being a Swiss company, that's very easy to deliver. And so that was the early driving force. And yeah, at, at RES, um, we have a very loyal customer base. Uh, we are a smaller company, so we're able to give very personalized service. And we really have some outstanding rides. And um, our rollerball, for example, is a vertical roller coaster. It's very low footprint. And we uh, unveiled this ride in 2016 at the Barcelona show uh, for IAPA. And it won a brass rings. You can see these all over the world now. Uh, in fact, we've got one at Adventureland, Long Island in the States. Um, and we're very proud of that ride. And there's more of them uh, that are yet to come. Um, another very special ride for us is our Canyon Slide Rapids that we installed at Silver Dollar City for their 60th anniversary. And this is really a truly unique ride because it has a Western Hemisphere's highest drop on a raft ride um, at 14 meters. And the, the lift uh, circles um, and reaches a height of 27 meters. So we're very, very proud of that ride and the awards that, that it has won. And of course, we also build towers, flume rides, um, interactive water rides, uh, wheels, um, you name it, family rides and thrill rides of all type. So yeah, that's a little bit about RES. Yeah, you know, Deborah, before we started recording, I was telling Josh that I spent um, last year, I went to Silver Dollar City and I spent probably 15 minutes or so just watching the lift of that raft yes. because I'm a, I'm a, you know, rides guy at heart. And that's, and just our, we saw that and we we were just fascinated by it. We took pictures of it. We took videos of it. It was just that to us, you know, was, was part of the attraction. Right. It was so unique the way that it worked. 
Well, exactly. And whether we're creating a brand new ride that is completely unique, we can take existing rides and add things to them that make them stand out. Yeah. We're glad yeah. you like that one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to switch gears just for a second, because I know that you mentioned that you've worked with Josh and, um, you know, I've worked with Josh now for a number of years here on the podcast, but I'm always interested in stories about him, you know, before I knew him. So you hired him many years ago at Pixolve. So what kind of memories do you have from, from that time when you were able to hire oh, Josh? Role? Oh my goodness. Um, well, first of all, I just want to say when I hired Josh, I was so impressed with the experience that he had in the industry already. He was truly an attractions enthusiast through and through. He was very eager, very young, um, and he had great um, relationship skills. He just really nailed it. And I, there was no one that I would rather have hired than Josh for the position of the manager of photography concessions at Legoland Florida. Um, so when when Josh started working for us, we really had to, you know, sketch out things well in advance. Um, he started working um, but way before Legoland Florida opened. So we really had a unique opportunity to work together and travel together. Um, and then Josh came over to the UK uh, for some training. And that's where I have a lot of my stories. So I recall telling Josh, yeah, Josh, meet me over in the UK. I'll be at Windsor, in front of Castle Windsor, on a bench at one o'clock. And uh, sure enough, he showed up. Uh, I was really impressed with his ability to get there. <clears throat> After that, we had to take a train. This is my favorite story. I tell this many, many times. Sorry, Josh. So um, we went to the train station. We checked the timings of the train. And I left Josh at the platform where we'd be getting the train. And I said, hey, I'm really hungry. Wait here just for about 10 minutes, and I'll come back with some food. And I didn't have much time, ran off to the store next door, came back with the quickest thing that I could grab that was front of the store, which was a box of Krispy Kremes. Went back, was running down the station steps, saw Josh standing there on the yellow line, exactly where I had left him. And a high-speed train was coming through. And Josh was literally, his hair was blowing straight back. So... I thought it was so funny. I was like, Josh, Josh, no, I, I didn't mean like, don't move an inch. Just like, don't, you know, go to another platform. So that was a good laugh. And then we got on the train and stuffed our faces with Krispy Kremes. That yes. was, I, you know, it, now I, I live in Chicago now and I'm used to taking public transit a lot. I was, I was living in Florida then. So the idea of these high speed trains coming through the station, especially one that was going to go through the station, it didn't stop at all. That to me was when, when you said, Josh, don't move. I was like, okay, for my own personal safety, I'm not going to move at all whatsoever. I'm going to stay right here. I'm surprised and, you were still standing. Yeah. <laughs> standing in the eggs. And, and I, I forgot about the, the donuts. That's right. At least there was, there was a reward for me being, being kind of, kind of mini traumatized in that moment that we got to have donuts. Yeah. Well, at least it was behind the yellow line, if not on it. That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, so yeah, then, um, you know, we always had the standing joke that everybody, every time we went in to get a coffee, which as an American, we found every Starbucks we could, they always got my name wrong. Um, so that was kind of a standing joke. Um, but yeah, yeah. I remember also yeah. that I can't remember what the name was. Do you remember? Oh, it was Tab, if I remember. Tab, yeah. right. Deb. <laughs> they, they put Tab. I mean, where they got that? I have no idea. <laughs> I can't believe you remember that, Josh. <laughs> um, so I think I was back in the States and Josh ended up, you know, he had more time. So we thought you're really benefiting from this training, stay on a week longer. Um, and I asked Josh, were you able to go to the laundry to wash your clothes? And he said, oh, no, I just washed them on the bathtub. The, if I recall this very well now, yes, the, the laundromat was going to be, was about two miles away. And so I was, I, I was in the UK for close to four weeks. So I packed <laughs> one giant suitcase stuffed, you know, as many clothes as I could. And I had to do laundry right around the halfway point. And it was easier for me to walk over to the Tesco 
and buy the detergent and then hand wash all of my clothes in the bathtub and then hang them out, drape them all over my hotel room so they could dry manually than it would have been to actually, well, maybe in retrospect, perhaps it would have been easier to actually go however many miles away it was to the laundromat. But in that moment, it, it made the most sense to do it right then and there. <laughs> yeah, and they probably didn't have Uber back then, did they? Nope, nope. It was all, I had, I had all the cash for the taxis and yeah, that was, uh, you know, that, that trip for me, that was, that was my first time in the UK. It was my first time taking, taking all, all those trains, both on a, on a daily regular basis. And then even to get up to, to Staffordshire, to go to Alton Towers and the office in Derby. I, that to me, I, I had to learn a lot about, <laughs> about transit and, and trains and how to get around a country I'd never been to before. At least I spoke the language though. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. I always say that I speak several languages, English, American English, British English, French, and Spanish. <laughs> you get double duty for the British and the American English. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Love the balloons there, Matt. <laughs> Thanks. I'm not sure why it does that, but okay. Uh, <laughs> Celebration. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Actually, I actually have, have a question for Josh. Um, since, you know, we have Deborah here. In those early days, besides learning that you didn't have to stand right next to the uh, train at the uh, at the train station, what are some things that you remember learning from Deborah or through that experience in those early days of of working at Pixolve? Mm -hmm. You know, what's funny is, is Deborah, you mentioned KPIs briefly earlier in one of your previous responses. I thought, you know what? I remember asking you once, what's what's a KPI? What is what does that mean? So I, I learned that from you because uh, I definitely was, you know, looking back, I was I was a young leader at that time. So there was there was a lot of development that I needed to go through for my career growth from from the position that I had come from and the part that I was at to be able to learn a whole I was I was in leadership previously but now I was in higher levels of management so from everything from you know being at a park you know 7 months prior to the opening and really following the project management plan and keeping everything on schedule and what to do if I'm sitting around waiting for a response of how to kind of be that squeaky wheel to be able to kind of keep things moving and, and going in the direction. Because uh, I, I remember, I think at one point you said, opening day is going to get here. And regardless of where we're at, we open. That's that's what's going to happen on you know on, on opening days. We're 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 going to open no matter how ready we are. So we want to make sure to do to do as much in advance to be able to do that. Uh, and then I would also say from following the metrics and being very metric driven, everything I learned about spend per head or per capita spending and using that kind of as a as a north star and everything that that we're delivering. Uh, but also I think that the permission and almost kind of empowerment to to be creative where you know once i had my my team very much in place and once we were operating of being able to look at it through the lens of saying can we test and adjust some things can we do things on on a small scale see what their response is and if it's positive then we expand it out you know for instance i you know one of the the retail products at legoland is being able to buy your picture on a lego brick wall it's the signature product to you know be able to do that and when we had a guest who was we had guests often debating whether between should i buy the standard picture for 14.99 or should i buy the lego brick wall for 35.99 even the conversations i would have and, and even the the uh, conversations that the frontline team members would have of uh, being able to say, okay, well, how can we encourage them to actually get both? They might not want to pay full price for both, but they're, if we can sell them both, we know that there's a, a, a decent margin on the Lego brick wall, but there's a really big margin on the picture. So what if we get the picture in their hands regardless? And then that came to the idea of saying, if a guest is going to buy a Lego brick wall, let's sell them the picture at $5 instead of $15. And when we did that, we saw a tangible increase in, you know, in, in revenue and per capita spending. And it was doing that through, through that testing and being able to see, okay, what works? If it doesn't work, we're not going to do it. We're only doing it in, in small little bits and pieces at a time. So I think that that ability to kind of be creative and, and innovate, I, I, I recall, you know, a, a lot of that really coming from, from that time and our time together. Yeah. And I think you could almost get a PhD in guest services, guest experience um, in that experience working at Pixolve. And, and you're right, Josh, because we really did 
fine tune the impact on KPIs or metrics based on one change. And that's something I really learned from Merlin Entertainments, which was don't make a bunch of changes at once, make one change, and then you've got to track it over a period of time <clears throat> to see you know, what the real impact is. And so we were very forensic um, and creative at the same time. And Josh, you probably recall much of our insights into guest uh, experience. And I recall um, doing some sessions around guest experience through the eyes of the guest. And, you know, literally we would get down on our hands and knees to see the perspective of a young child um, or sit on a bench to understand the perspective of maybe an elderly uh, grandparent that's attending uh, with their family. And I thought much of the experiences uh, at those um, days uh, at Pixel, at the park level, and being able to not just understand guest service from an American standpoint, but also European, um, UK, or Asian, um, for that matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would also even expand on that, too, to say, looking at the operation and the guest experience through the lens of a supplier that's operating a concession, because all the experience I had prior to that, I, you know, I worked for Disney, I worked for Universal, I worked for Cedar Fair, so I had the experience of working for the park, and then coming to Pixel. I was working in the park and as far as guests were concerned, you know, like there was no difference between a Legoland employee and a Pixel employer, the contractor, the third, uh, third person, third party, sorry, uh, concessionaire, but doing it of saying we're managing the guest experience, but we're also managing the client experience as well, as well as the employee experience of all the team members that are that are on the team. So it was a very interesting balance of all the stakeholders with it as well. Yeah, it's really B2B and B2C at the same right. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that that I'm curious about, Deborah, is now, especially in your role as international sales and marketing director, um, you talked about kind of looking at things from the guest perspective, you know, internationally and what a, a UK visitor might look for and an American visitor and so on. I would imagine you have to look through a similar kind of lens you know, no pun intended with Pixel, but a similar kind of lens when you are looking at different sales channels or marketing channels um, based on your your ability to get out there and, and tell your story to various, you know, people around the world. Yeah, that's an interesting question, Matt. Um, but what I'd say is that we have a very loyal customer following um, where because we create unique rides every year, like this year we unveiled the Sunseeker at Vienna and then the Skyseeker um, at Orlando. People can, are, we have a great following where people simply want to know what's new. And so I think globally, everyone is looking for a new experience. Um, the, the guest at theme parks is now very well traveled. Um, either throughout the United States or even abroad. And so, you know, guests are looking for something new. And because we know that, um, and because our um, the parks are coming to us looking for something new, this validates our sort of driving force of creating unique, safe, and quality products. And, and because we've won so many awards, we've won um, five brass ring awards, uh, four golden tickets, and seven European star awards. Um, so just that alone validates that we're getting something right. Well, I think that's that's a good uh, a topic to I'd love to expand and, and dive further into. Even more, most recently, uh, you won a brass ring just in 2023 for best new product for family ride and attraction. Can you talk about what what that's like of of being able to to just win the brass ring, kind of, I would say everything that went into it, and then the feeling of uh, of when you learned that that you won. Yeah, we were over the moon to have won the brass rings, and of course, we had just previously won the European Star Award and the Park Scout Award at Vienna just prior to the brass rings in Orlando. Um, so our fingers were crossed, but. We weren't sure because we were a European installation if we would get recognized at IAPA. So yeah, we were just so excited. And um, it was so important to us um, and to Coneyland, Switzerland, uh, where we installed the Vertical Dark Ride that won the award uh, for Best New Family um, Product. Um, 
So this is a really amazing ride. It is a vertical dark ride. Um, Coney Land built a 20 meter uh, building to house it. And this ride was so full of um, media, multimedia story. Uh, the crazy professor um, has an experiment and thinks he can defy gravity. And throughout the experience, when guests go through the queue line, they're exposed to incredible theming and then a, a terrific uh, pre-show. They board the tower, uh, the 10 seat gondola, um, and then the multimedia is over 20 meters. And the story unfolds and there's all sorts of sensory um, elements like back jabbers, there's air blasts, there's fog, uh, the seats tilt forward. And by the time they get to the top of the tower, the experiment goes wrong and uh, the guests suddenly drop unexpectedly into a 20 meter free fall. Um, so it was very deserving of the awards, I feel. Um, and we we're just over the moon for it. And these awards are so important to suppliers because it just validates that you're doing something right. Hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sounds like an amazing uh, attraction. Um, one of the things that I would love to to kind of get your take on, since you've had such a, a really interesting career that's gone through a lot of different, a lot of, a lot of changes in a lot of different industries, is thinking about some of the advice maybe that you got along the way. I know you mentioned the book that you you talked about the first 90 days, which is fascinating. Uh, but any other specific advice that you got from people that really helped propel you forward? Well, I think firstly, it's very important to have mentors um, and to call on people that may be working in the specific field that you're uh, working in to ask advice. Um, it's amazing how willing people are to help. And I've been asked to be a mentor for others. And I think if you ask someone to be your mentor, it's very complimentary to the person. So, you know, first of all, you need to speak up and have mentors. Um, but I think the biggest advice that I got about my career was when I left Fly Avionics to go to Pixel. And also working in the fashion retailing early on because I had to set up one operation and I was expected to leave it in a very short time. So I needed to replicate myself. And the advice was that hire people that are better than yourself and you need to future proof the organization, the operation, whatever have you, so that when you're stepping onto something else, whether it be with the same company or another, you've left things in a better place than when you started. And, and then you don't have to be afraid to take on new challenges when you can leave that current role knowing that you've done a very, very good job. So look at what are the metrics, what do you need to achieve, and future-proof. That's some great advice I've gotten along the way. Great. Yes. Excellent. So we only have a few minutes left here, but uh, there is one other thing that uh, we want to talk about as well, and that is your involvement with the IAPA Foundation Board of Directors. Uh, you spent more than 10 years as, as a member uh, on the Board of Directors. Can you talk about just your involvement with the foundation and as well as just the, the impact that it has? Sure, Josh. Um, well, the IAPA Foundation has been around for many, many years, and I was approached by Ted Moulter, um, who asked me if I was interested in joining the foundation board. And of course, I was honored to be asked and um, got to know the board. And early, early on in those early days, the board didn't really have a set mission. We didn't have a lot of money, um, and our direction wasn't exactly articulated. Um, it was very difficult for us to tell others what was the foundation. So when I was at Pixolf, we held a two-day session at our offices there. Um, we had the likes of uh, John McReynolds come in from Universal, Jane Cooper from Hershen, and Jim Shea from Premier Rides. And for two days, we sat and we talked about what the mission of the foundation should be. How can we raise more money? So within a few years time, we also brought on Tom and Bobby Wages, who graciously volunteered their time uh, for the foundation. And at that point, we started offering scholarships to young promising talent that were looking to study um, in the attractions industry at places like UCF, Rosen, or even Brada uh, over in Europe. 
So uh, year on year, we kept awarding scholarships and the foundation operated really sort of behind the scenes and no one knew a lot about them. Um, we had some silent auctions at IAPA. I remember one year Dolly Parton offered up her guitar and there was a bidding war for that. So we, we started to raise a little bit of more money. Um, and then soon after that, of course, sadly, with the untimely death of uh, Al Weber, um, he endowed the foundation. Um, and so we started to gain a little bit more traction. And um, so after, what, nine years, I think it was, I was on the foundation board, um, we got the real backing of IAPA finally. And so it was even this last year at, at IAPA in um, Vienna that IAPA held an event and publicized an auction for the foundation. So I feel like, again, future-proofing, setting a mission, knowing what we need to do. Um, I feel like um, I left the foundation in a better place um, than when I, I started. So that was very important to me. And I feel so proud of the foundation because I love to be a mentor uh, for youth, um, for young professionals. Um, I'll often have uh, young um, high school uh, or college graduates come and work with me in our offices just to see you know, what we do. Um, I've also had opportunities to um, guest lecture at the University of Iowa to business students. And I always tell the story of our industry. And so I feel that the foundation um, is really strong now and is doing great things to give scholarships and to help attract and retain good talent into our industry. And if you want to donate to the IAPA Foundation, you can find them on IAPA website, just a little plug. <laughs> <laughs> Love that plug, and absolutely, we are we are dedicated to the uh, the young folks in the industry as well. So, thank you very much for for sharing that and for being such an advocate for the new talent that is coming up through the through the industry. Uh, but Deborah, we are kind of running low on time, and uh, this has been a great great conversation. Thank you, thank you so much for being here. If anybody wanted to learn more about you or RES Rides, where would you send them? Well, first, they go to our web our website, which is www.res.swiss. And you can also go to our YouTube channel where you can see videos of all of our rides. Awesome. Well, as we start to wind this down, one final question, and that's what's, what's next for RES rides? What's coming up in the pipeline? Oh, my goodness. We have so much coming up in the pipeline. In fact, um, we're really excited to be um, manufacturing our first Wave Twist L which is a flat roller coaster where a, a ginormous um, vehicle holds two gondolas that all circulate whilst moving along the track. And meanwhile, while the main vehicle moves, each gondola is spinning. Um, so that's coming and will be installed in 2025. We're also building our first Oracle, um, which is for a German showman. This is a multi-dimensional ride. There's four gondolas attached to four arms or attached to two arms that all circulate. Everything moves in a very crazy fashion, um, but it's a very smooth ride. So that's very exciting. And we're also currently installing our air loop um, at the Serengeti Park in Germany. Uh, this is the world's first uh, suspended powered uh, interactive roller coaster in the world. It's a huge track, it's 420 meters, and each uh, rider can tip left or tip right in their seat or do 360 barrels while the coaster is moving along the track. So there's tons of exciting stuff coming up. Um, so watch this space, Josh and Matt. We will. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, Deborah, thank you again for your time today. We really do appreciate it. And everybody for, out there who's watching and listening, just remember, we are all Attraction Pros. Thanks for listening to the Attraction Pros podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can tune in when new episodes release. And even better, please leave us a review on iTunes. For more information, visit attractionpros.com.